Good morning, and welcome to Conversations in Christ. We invite you to sit back, open your Bible, and engage in a dialogue as we learn together more about the incredible gift of grace that God has given all of us. Now, let's reason together in love. Good morning, Carl. Hey, good morning, Bill. Good morning, Roland. Nice good morning. To have, nice to have you back. Thanks. Good to be okay. here. And then Roland is living in Reading, right? That's it. Yep. So he's down in Grass Valley for, uh, you know, for the holidays, and yeah. we thought we'd just bring him in here and have him share what's uh, what's going on in his life. Oh, this is good. We, we're glad you uh, joined us. Yeah. We we've talked about it for quite a while and threatened and planned and took about a year. Mm-hmm. That's right. So thanks for joining us. Yep. Before Roland moved to Reading, he was pastoring at First Baptist Church in Nevada That's City. Right. Yeah. So, so good to have you. All right, so we're going to be going into uh, Matthew chapter 2, 1 through 12, and we're going to continue with the Christmas story. And so, Roland, why don't you pick up in verse 1? All right. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw a star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Okay, what stands out there in those first six verses? Well, a lot, I suppose. Um, you have uh, wise men. Uh, we, they're commonly referred to as, as magi. We, we get the word magician uh, from the Greek word here. And they come from the east. And most, I guess, think Babylon or um, somewhere far off in that direction. Mm-hmm. And they see a star. And uh, there's been a lot of, uh, you know, we're a lot of thought about what is a star. You know, was this a a, um, a a comet of some kind, or was it a supernatural being, an angel? Mm-hmm. I tend to think the latter because the star actually moves and it, it stands above the house. Mm-hmm. And stars usually don't get that specific with their movements. And um, and I guess another question is, you know, how did the wise men come to associate a star with the birth of the king of the Jews, the Messiah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How that come to be? Because they're way over there in Persia or Babylon, way east. Um, you know, out of the, um, the area where the Jews primarily resided. Of course, they were taken into Babylon and Syria at different mm-hmm. times. Mm-hmm. And and so, how do they come to hear about it? Yeah. Well, oh. apparently there's a, some astrology going on. Or astronomy. Hopefully astronomy yeah. rather than astrology. Maybe a little strong. Well, they, they, may, they have, may have been of that, uh, that persuasion. But when they've, when they've worked the uh, solar system backwards mm-hmm. to that date or that year, uh, there was an alignment of, of like Jupiter and Saturn or something. They got real close together. And when they get close together in the sky, it makes them look like one bright star. So that they, there might have been a... Uh, you know, uh, uh, something that they looked into and saw this alignment's going to happen because the, 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 the uh, heavens were very mysterious and they uh, added a lot of uh, spiritual guesswork to them in those days. Mm-hmm. And God may have used that to draw them to, to where, they, where they came. And yeah. to see that phenomenon, or it might have been even enhanced by some kind of, of phenomenon that God brought on top of that. But it's kind of an interesting a bunch of events that happened. Yeah, and you know, I was looking at that because I had kind of a similar question. Is so, what got these guys started? And and it could be as I was looking at a little bit of the background that they were kind of plugged into, um, you know, just some signs and omens. Uh, they were considered pilgrims. I mean, so it's not you can't really get much information on in terms of where were they spiritually, what were they thinking, but they were certainly affected by the times. And they were mm-hmm. they were picking up either from 
you know, from ast astrology mm -hmm. and our astronomy, and then, or they were picking up signs and, and wonders, or they could have been, you know, <clears throat> discussing things with the scribes and the chief priests. And another thought was, well, it was just God bigger than all that and divinely intervene, and it became instinctive. They just knew mm -hmm. that this is what they needed to do. Yeah. They needed mm -hmm. to follow that star, and there was something within them that was motivating them and directing them towards Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. perhaps they got, they got a word of knowledge, you know, one of the yeah. gifts of the Spirit. Um, often, also what is pointed out was, of course, Daniel um, was taken captive, and he was in Babylon, and he um, climbed up the ranks, but... Some would think that uh, Daniel and the um, would kind of clue in the people over there, so they would hear about the Messiah and the prophecy of Daniel's uh, seventy weeks uh, in chapter nine, and so perhaps they were influenced through the Jews and their scriptures, which were brought over in that direction because of them being exiled, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so there could have been some influence with the scriptures there as well, and they they were aware of such things. Um, oh, by the way, this this and and. It's interesting, this was not a short journey for them, not a weekend. They had to travel, they've traveled from Persia mm -hmm. over that same route that Abraham took. That that would have taken a long time. About so 800 this is, miles. Yeah, so this had to be uh, known of, from for them way back. It's not like they got the message the, mm -hmm. the weekend before. So this was a planned out thing that God had had done in some way in mm -hmm. their life. In Numbers 24, there's uh, Balaam gives a number of uh, oracles and begin verse 15 it reads and he took up his discourse and said the oracle of Balaam the son of Baor the oracle of the man whose eye is opened the oracle of him who hears the words of God and knows the knowledge of the Most High who sees the vision of the Almighty falling down with his eyes uncovered and here you go verse 17 I see him but not now I behold him but not near a star shall come out of Jacob and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. And the uh, oracle goes on. And so um, Jews then, apparently Jews today, they see Numbers 24, 17 about a star coming out of Jacob, a scepter, which would be in, you know something that a king would hold, um, rising out of Israel as a prophecy of the coming Messiah. Of course, we believe he came. Mm -hmm. um, but perhaps this was a verse that was shared and, and made known among those living over there as well. So there's a number of theories, mm -hmm. yep. how they found out. Um, I mean, I guess God ultimately only knows. Well, and it goes even beyond uh, these guys, because you, when you look at verse 3, it says, When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, mm -hmm. and, and all of Jerusalem with him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, troubled is, is you know, kind of... Uh, least impactful in terms of how he was really struggling with this because he was actually paranoid thinking here's this this king of the Jews that's going to come along and was going to take him out yeah mm -hmm. and 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 Herod if we know anything about him he was ruthless mm -hmm. if, if he felt his uh, position was at stake mm -hmm. he was willing to kill family mm -hmm. friends scribes and Pharisees, military. He was willing to take anybody out to, to, to hold on to his position. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when it says he was troubled, he was, he was very much, mm -hmm. uh, you know, paranoid. Well, he knew yeah. something was up. And, and uh, pro most likely it wasn't just three old king guys on camels walking, going across the desert. They probably had an, an entourage mm -hmm. of of protection and provisions and everything to make that journey. So when this big band of of folks come into town supporting these kings, and these are king guys, these are these are somebody uh, that may have disturbed him also. That you know what's going on, what's up here, what's happening, why are these kings coming from a long distance uh, for what I'm hearing is another king that that would disturb mm -hmm. him in, in, from several angles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, to pick back on what you said, Bill, I, it might have been Josephus, but someone wrote, uh, it's better to be, it was better to be um, Herod's pig than his friend. Because uh, a pig he probably wouldn't kill, um, uh, holding to the dietary restrictions, but a friend, he killed his wife, he killed several of his children. Um, so he was a ruthless man. And all of Jerusalem are troubled with him. Yeah. Yeah. And they might be wondering, okay, what is going to happen now? Yeah, we right. know his character, and what is he going to do? And so he inquires... 
of the chief priests and scribes of the people, uh, the, the, the people knowledgeable of the Torah, the scriptures, and asked them where the Christ was to be born. And um, they are in unison here. They're not confused. And they quote uh, Micah 5 2. And they say, Ben Bethlehem. Uh, that's where the that's where the rule of the Jews who um, was going to come from, who was going to shepherd my people Israel. So mm -hmm. he gets his answer. Yeah, and you know because Herod was so paranoid, he goes to the scribes and Pharisees and he and he demands, mm. I want to know exactly where this place is. Right. Uh, because you know he. He knows, you know, he needs to send someone there. He needs to nip it in the yeah, bud yeah. right he needs now. To get this thing over with. Yeah. And if of course, talk about overkill, he, he kills all the children mm -hmm. up to two years. And that's not just overkill. It, some time had passed uh, or could have passed uh, during that. So it, it had to, uh, Christ might have been, by the time all this transpired, it might have been a, a young child. In fact, isn't there, mm -hmm. there are two Greek words used? Once for a baby, and once it, it mm -hmm. also applied to him for being a small child. Mm -hmm. Different word. So yeah. we, we, you know, the Christmas stories are fun and everything. Mm -hmm. They're not always accurate, but but we like them. But it's good to get down to some accuracy. Yeah. Speaking of accuracy, uh, even our our, um, you know, Jesus' birth splits history in two. So that's how important he is. Yeah. Um, but uh, most believe, I think rightly so, Jesus was born. He wasn't born at zero or one. Mm -hmm. uh, he was born between. Uh, 6 and 4 BC, Herod um, died, it's kind of a matter of fact, 4 BC. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Herod is alive during this time, which means Jesus was born before Herod's death at 4 BC. Yeah. So, um, and the fact that Herod, after the wise men uh, receive um, uh, a word from an angel to go another way, and they do that, and Herod finds out he actually has all the children in Bethlehem, two years, all the boys, two years and younger killed. So in other words, he, he aims above when Jesus would have been born. So mm -hmm. Jesus might have been born 5 BC, you know, which is kind of interesting to, to think about that. And um, it was, uh, I, I guess it was in the sixth century. Um, uh, that's when the number was calced out and the guy got it wrong. And ever since then, we're just living with that. Why change it now, right? So um, a lot of interesting stuff. What do you guys think about moving on? Begin of verse seven and- Yeah, good. Yeah, Carl, you wanna read that? No. All right, you're, <laughs> you're, you're not reader. much of a reader. <laughs> Verse 7, Then Herod, when he had privately called the, the wise men, inquired of them diligently, what time does the star appear? And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. <laughs> Boy, that's stretching the truth. Mm. And... And so, and then, then he, let's see, verse, uh, where is that, seven or eight? eight you did eight. eight. Okay, nine. nine. <laughs> when they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And then verse 10, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they were coming into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country and went another way. So these guys are in tune with God in some way mm -hmm. to get revelation from him and even know to, to bring gifts <clears throat> for someone that they're going to worship, a little baby. They're, they're, they're tuned into this in some way that, uh, that, that others around them, even at that time in that location, weren't. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, kind of a, an early <laughs> picture of the Gentiles coming into Messiah, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the first wor worshipers of Jesus are Gentiles, foreigners. And I think that's kind of a really neat to see that um, they were the first ones to worship Jesus. Yeah, you know, what kind of stands out here for me too is the fact that everything that is going around Jerusalem at the time is all about, here's this person who's being born, 
Uh, very historical person, uh, very important person, but that doesn't even pale t to you know to what they were really coming up with, and and what everybody was unanimously were coming up with is this person needs to be worshipped, mm -hmm. and so you got the Magi going there, they're going to worship him. Now you got Herod, theoretically, he's going to go there and worship, and. Uh, at least he knows he's supposed to. <laughs> and, and I think most of Jerusalem knew what was happening at this, this time. This was a special event. Mm -hmm. And here's the Savior of the world uh, coming down in, into humanity. And there was this instinctive sense that was, had built up in, in that, that area that this is a person of importance, but more importantly, this is a person who needs to be worshipped. Something big was happening, and they did not fully realize or know what that was really all about. That took his whole life and his death and his resurrection and, and further on before that became more realized. And we're still groping, wrestling with it today, trying to fully understand this. As, as you and I, Bill, every week we, we try to present this whole message of grace Mm -hmm. and God's love for his world. And this was just the beginning of it. You know, this incarnation thing is interesting that, that it's not just something God had to do to get this plan of salvation going. It's part of salvation. Uh, there's a great book, historical book by Athanasius from the uh, third century, fourth century. Uh, he called it the incarnation. It's a short little book, has a a uh, preface uh, by C.S. Lewis, by the way, a very good little book. And his whole point is that the incarnation is part of salvation. For God to come and become a human being and join the human race, that's the, the very core of what salvation is because it's not just God remotely saying, I will save you and I like you and, hey, I've shown up. He joined us. He, he became human. He lived with us. He lived with temptation and, and all of the agony and difficulties and, and said, I'm going to die with you. You guys are dying. I'm going to die with you. And what happens to you happens to me. And therefore, what happens to me is going to happen to you in the resurrection. So it's, it's just the beginning of this whole salvation process that includes the incarnation, includes his death, and includes his resurrection. It's a whole package, really three things. The, the, the birth, death, and resurrection of Christ, and of course, the ascension. Yeah, and, I, and uh, another purpose for worshiping him, as, as we saw last week, is he's been announced as he is the savior of the world. He's coming to forgive sin, yep. sin of all of mankind. And, and so if there's... Well, that was clearly his goal. The, the scope of his, his, his saving work is at least he wants to save the, the whole world, mm -hmm. everybody, all humanity. The question is, did he pull it off? Is, that, is, that, is he successful in that? Mm -hmm. Or is it just give it the good old college try? And we believe that he was successful in that. That's what he came to do and he accomplished it. That's not too hard for him. And it's not unlike God to want to come and save his world and save everyone. That's, 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 and, and for him to do it, to do all of it, so we don't have to live with the burden of, oh, I, I gotta do something, I gotta do something to get right with God. Mm -hmm. Well, we do do something right to get right with God in that we in our experience get right with him, but there's no merit in that. He already took care of that for us. And now we respond properly in faith without earning anything, and now we get to engage with him and enjoy that relationship that's, that's completely by grace, but through faith and through our apprehension of it by our faith. And by the incarnation, he's God taking on the form of a man, uh, not exhibiting any of his divine possibilities, let's just say, but comes as a man and interacts, has compassion, mercy, uh, empathy, uh, understands men's struggle with sin. Lives under limitations, mm -hmm. knowledge limitations, as well as physical ones. And yet doesn't sin, but but he involves himself completely. And, yeah. and it says, and, and that's where he, they give him this name, Emmanuel. God is with us. And here's God interacting with all of mankind at that point in time in history.
Mm-hmm. And that's that's an amazing that, thing. That's grounds for worship, think right of that. there. Think <laughs> of that. God coming down saying, "I'll hang out with all of you, and I'll I'll deal with I'll I'll put up with you, and I'll interact with you, and I'll be patient and loving about it, and I'll even let you kill me, mm-hmm. and I'm still gonna make good out of it." Wow. What? <laughs> that's a yeah, great. So that in the next life we can all inter- involve ourselves with Him and hang yeah. out with Him. There you go. Yeah. Wow. That's. <laughs> What a, what a good news message mm-hmm. we have. Yeah, I mean, the, the word, um, we find that the shepherds are told good news at the birth of Jesus. And so, yeah, the good news doesn't necessarily start when Jesus begins preaching, though. He begins preaching the gospel and the good news. Uh, but the good news starts at the birth of Jesus. Yeah. And um, certainly during the ministry of Jesus, his death mm-hmm. and his resurrection, yeah. ascension. And I would just add the accession, which is interesting. Ascension would be his... Is, is rising a session would be his taking seat, and um, and of course we've we've talked about uh, the role of faith and whatnot mm-hmm. in salvation, and and you guys know that we we disagree, but we disagree lovingly. We do. Um, I see more of a participation in, in faith uh, playing a role, but um, but you know with, with this story, it, it is so. It, the very end is interesting as well, and it's all interesting and captivating. How God becomes flesh in the person of Jesus, and He is salvation. And here He is being worshipped by Gentiles, which is a picture, I think, of things to come. You know, Matthew's gospel it is uh, very has very a very Jewish focus because you find um, in Matthew one twenty one it says His people, by the way, and I take that as primarily Jews, Uh because you have a distinct set of people. And then Matthew 10, Jesus sends his disciples, says, go nowhere among the Gentiles, uh, but only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, very Mm Israel-focused. And Matthew 15, the Canaanite woman uh, wanted her uh, child to be healed, and Jesus said, hey, I didn't come for you. Mm -hmm. I came for the Jews, basically. Um, But then you find this expanded after his resurrection, right? Go make disciples of all nations, Mm -hmm. baptize them, teach them to observe all things I have commanded. And so you see this broadening out to the whole world. But here you get an early glimpse with Gentiles coming to worship Jesus. And they bring him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And, you know, you have to kind of wonder, I mean, does God use these gifts? I believe he does. Of course, they're about to go down Egypt, right? Mm -hmm. And so the gold would naturally be a, a, a timely resource, you know, a provision from God via these wise men, and that could help them uh, procure certain things that they needed to live because they're about to, you know, flee. And um, and the same thing, I guess, with the frankincense and myrrh as well. But um, those those were, you know, this is uh, kind of interesting to think of. These were just these were herbs, uh, and they could have sold these herbs, but they also had just medicinal healing properties, you know, mm-hmm. so um, these might have been herbs. I think they were quite common, which mm-hmm. people would ingest and would do good things for the body as well. But they could have simply been sold as well to mm-hmm. to provide a way for Jesus and his family to live in Egypt for a time. Well, they gave him something. They were bringing something mm-hmm. of value mm-hmm. to him. That that's what you do in, in worship. Is, mm-hmm. And, and you know, when we worship, we go, well, God, what can I give you that is, is of any worth? Well, myself. And that's all he wants. You know, all the other stuff and even the the trying to impress him or anything. He just wants us to give ourselves to him. And he says, I love you and puts his big arms around us and puts us on his lap and hugs us and makes us feel as secure as we really are in him. It's just a wonderful thing. Well, and, and the other thing, too, these are maybe symbolic. Uh, gold was, was something that... Uh, you know, other other kings, other princes would, as they visited other kings, they would they would give gold as mm-hmm. a gift. Mm-hmm. Uh, incense was used back in the sacrificial times, mm-hmm. and incense was sprinkled on those animal sacrifices or whatever was being sacrificed. That's not how it was used in the '60s. We burned it. You burned it, yeah. <laughs> and then myrrh was used for um, when you were suffering, yeah, and in pain. Mm-hmm. So you know, so you got these three. In one sense, very symbolic elements that are being presented. Yeah, very expensive gifts. And was was there a reason why these guys picked out these particularly um, particular three things here? Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I, I don't want to stretch it too much, mm-hmm. but uh, they were thought through. 
by by the Magi. Yeah. And they certainly had practical value. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and, and of course, this is, I think, why, you know, how many wise men were there? Well, we don't know. Well, we, we don't, don't know, right? Yeah. But it's always three. Yeah. And usually it's because you have three gifts. And so yeah. you associate yeah. the number of gifts with the yeah. number of wise men. Yeah. And, and we don't know. I As you said, Carl, and entourage, they would have had uh, security with them. Yeah. And this was a big group of people yeah. traveling a great long distance yeah. uh, to pay homage of the King of Kings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Okay, anything and, else? We've only got another minute left. Well, and I, I think that... Uh, you know what? What spoke very highly to to Herod was these these three or four um, who knows entourage of magi were coming to worship Jesus Christ, and that those guys had all the respect in the world for Herod, and so that's why he says to them, "All right, we've got this deal going on. I'm going to let you go to Bethlehem, but here's one thing I want you to do: I want you to come back, and I want you to tell me exactly where he is." And of course, they just do an end around and yeah. So I can, <laughs> so I can go worship him. Yeah, yeah right, right. With a, with a sword behind your back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, look, at, uh, we got to go. And I just want to thank Roland for coming on for a couple of weeks. We mm -hmm. we enjoyed having you, and you're you're such a good friend. And we well, hope you. to have you on again sometime. Yeah. Thank you for listening to Conversations in Christ. Our prayer is that today's program has opened your heart and mind to a greater understanding and curiosity about the gift of grace that God has given to each of us in and through His Son, Jesus Christ. Remember, you have been blessed with every spiritual blessing by God, so that you may believe and begin to experience the very life of God in you. Tune in again next week for Conversations in Christ. If you have a comment or a question, we would love to hear from you. You can contact us at conversationsinchrist.net. That's conversationsinchrist.net.